All right, family, we are in the last week of our series titled God's Promises. Hasn't it been amazing? And so what I want you to do today is I want you to open up your heart for the word because I believe that God has a specific word for you today if we open up our heart and receive this anointed, powerful word from our very own Pastor Drew Jackson. Come on, everybody. Welcome him today. Come forward. Oh. Awesome. How's everybody doing today? Doing well? Great. Awesome. I'm going to sit down. Is that okay? Is that cool? All right. Thank you. Pastor Jeremy said I could sit down, so that's good. <clears throat> I'm going to do it. All right. Fantastic. Well, I, I am honored to be able to share this uh, final message in the Promises series. It's been a wonderful series. Everybody gotten something out of this this summer? The heart, I know Pastor Jeff's heart and desire behind this series was that everybody could have at least one promise that they could they'd kind of grab hold of and, and uh, take to the bank, you know, in their spiritual walk that would relate and connect with them. And so hopefully you've had that. If not, hey, this is our last chance. So we're going to try today, okay? Um, uh, let's jump right into the, the scripture. Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 28. Uh, God's everlasting love is the title of the, uh, the message today. It says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And we know there's some confidence in it. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you for another opportunity to worship you and to, to glorify you and honor you. And God, I ask that you would use me today to communicate your words and uh, that all of us in this room would have an increase in our heart and in our, our relationship with you. And so I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as I think of this passage, uh, I can't help but think of the life of Joseph. In the Bible, Joseph in the, in the Old Testament, um, Joseph the dreamer, maybe, maybe your Bible might say it that way, but uh, you can read about him in Genesis chapter 37, but just to kind of give a synopsis of his life, Joseph was, um, he was a dreamer, he, he had a desire for greatness, and I think, I think all of us have a desire for greatness uh, on the inside of us, and, and it's different for every one of us, um, what, what that desire is, specifically we might define greatness uh, a little different, each and every one of us. Maybe some of us want to be a great mom or a great dad, and, and God has placed that desire inside of us. Um, for others, it might be to be a great business owner or employer or employee. Um, and, and still for others, you, you might have aspirations to be a president or something, you know, uh, like that. But uh, we all have greatness uh, on the inside of us, and Joseph was no different. And, and Joseph actually had a dream. God gave him a dream when he was about 17 years old. And in this dream, he 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 was great. He was, he was the leader. He had tremendous authority, and, and, and he was honored and respected. And actually, his, his older brothers actually bowed down to him and, uh, and served him. And um, now he was 17, so he wasn't that wise yet. So he went out and told his brothers. And um, just a, a note to self, if you have older brothers and you have a dream of them bowing down and serving you, don't tell them, okay? Just, just keep it to yourself. Just throwing that out there. Um, it usually doesn't go over too well. And it didn't go over too well with his brothers and what made it worse is that his brothers were evil. <laughs> so, uh, so they sold him into slavery. And um, like really bad, you know. Um, so they sold him into slavery in Egypt. And he ends up going in this, uh, being a slave in this guy named Potiphar's house. And he's there and, and things begin to turn around. And, and he gets tremendous authority in Potiphar's house. And, and he's kind of the master over the whole household and all the affairs um, over this wealthy, influential person that he's working for. And so maybe at some point in his heart, he kind of thought, maybe, maybe this is what God meant when he gave me that dream. Maybe it's kind of, maybe it's kind of coming to pass. Um, I, can't, I mean, I can't help but think that, that maybe that's what Joseph thought. And he would kind of be in this role for a few years, and then uh, he would get falsely accused of raping his, uh, his master's wife. And, and then he was immediately thrown in prison. And so kind of on this roller coaster of life, and he's, he finds himself in prison, and, I mean, you got to just be down in the dumps at that point. You know, if you're Joseph and you're just like, what is going on, God? Why, why is this happening to me? And, and I thought things were kind of looking up. And um, time goes on. He, he is known as an interpreter of dreams. God gives him this gift. And, and he's known as that person in the prison. And time would go on. And, and the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, would have a, a dream and he would need interpretation. And so... Uh, Joseph's name came up, and he was brought in to, to go before the Pharaoh, and he interpreted his dream, and the, the Pharaoh liked the interpretation, and, 
and made him second in command over all of Egypt. Just overnight. Can you imagine that? Prison to there. And uh, second in command of all of Egypt. Some more time would go by. He'd save all of Egypt and the surrounding area through a famine. And lo and behold, his brothers and their families would come. And they would bow before him. They'd say, we need help. We need food. And he would grant them forgiveness. And, and his dream that God gave him 13 years earlier would, would come to pass. Now, something very interesting about this, this story in the Bible, and I encourage you to read it, is at, at various points throughout this story, there's a little sentence, and it says, and God was with Joseph. Throughout that whole challenge, throughout that whole struggle, in the good times, in the bad times, God was with Joseph. And, and the same is true for you, and the same is true for me, that, that no matter what we're going through, God is with us. And, and God is working on our behalf. He's working in our lives, and, and he loves us with an everlasting love. And so that, that's what we're kind of talking about today. So let's jump right into the passage. In Romans 8, 20, it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now there are some qualifiers in this promise. Just like the promise of peace, Pastor Jeff talked about it. You know, the promise of peace, there's if, um, uh, or, or give all your anxieties to God, and the peace of God will come. So it's, it's, you have to first do the give all your worries, give all your concerns to God, and then he'll take them and he'll replace it with his peace. So that's kind of a qualifier in, in, in that promise. Well, the same is true with this promise. There are qualifiers, and they're at the end here. It says, um, he works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. So the first one is love God, those that love God. Well, how do we know if we love God? And, and Jesus said, um, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. And, and it'll just happen. It'll, it'll, it's part of the natural process of being in a loving relationship with God is that you'll obey his commands. If you love me, you'll obey his commands. Now, it doesn't mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean that, that you never mess up, but you have a heart of obedience. And, and how I like to say it is you have a yes on the inside. And, and, and what that means is that you just kind of, with your relationship with God, you're, you just say, God, it doesn't matter what you ask me. Or, or what you call me to do, or what the next step is, the answer is already yes. I, I have a yes on the inside to you, God. And that's what it means to have a, a heart of obedience. So to love God, those that love God, those that have a heart of obedience. And then number two, it says, who have been called according to his purpose. And we could say here that, that these are the called. Whenever the Bible talks about the call, it's talking about people that are saved. People who have made a decision for Jesus Christ. You've said, God... Jesus, I received your free gift of everlasting life. Um, I, I realize that you died for my sins. You took my place, and, and I receive that gift now. So that's who this passage is talking to. Those who are in a loving, obedient relationship with Jesus. Now, here's the scary part. Here's kind of the scary part in this whole thing. Is, is that God allows us the freedom to choose him if we want to. To choose life or death, blessing or cursing. It's, it's, it's what he says in the scripture. And so we can live our whole life, we can have a great life, you can have an awesome life on this earth without God. But, but what will your eternity be like? And God wants to spend eternity with you. And that's why he sent his son Jesus to die and to take your place. And, 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 and the scary thing is, is that, that we can do pretty okay in this life without God. But what then, you know? Heaven and hell are realities, they're, they're a real thing. And so anyway, so, and we know that in all things, God works for the good. Those who love him. The qualifiers, you're a loving uh, or obedient follower of Jesus. So, real quick, I'm going to kind of break this down into three parts. What this passage is saying, what it is not saying, because I think we kind of get it confused sometimes, and then what God is ultimately trying to say in this entire chapter. Because there's like a bigger um, revelation, a bigger understanding that God is getting to, and it's in the, it's in the tail end, and we'll get to that uh, in a few minutes. But first, what does this passage mean? Well, it says that in all things. So all things. In all things. The good, the bad, the ugly. In all situations of life that you find yourself in. All your decisions before Christ, after Christ. The conditions you find yourself in. All things. The, the, the circumstances, the household you were, you were uh, raised in. The, the uh, environment that you found yourself in. Before your relationship with Christ and after your relationship with Christ. In all things, God, God is working in those things. So all things, that's what it means. Um, in all things, God works is what it says. And so I like to say it this way, God is working on your behalf. 
in all things, God is working on your behalf. That's good news. He's committed to you. To know that, that, that God is committed to you. He doesn't show up late and he doesn't give half effort. He's committed to you. He's committed to your life. Just like he was with Joseph and God was with Joseph. When it felt like he was there, when it didn't feel like he was there. God was with him. In the same way God is committed to you. He's working on your behalf. So the question isn't, God, are you working on my behalf? It's, God, how can I partner with you as you work on my behalf? How, how, can, I, how can I work in, in harmony, in, in unison with what you're already doing in my life? So he's at work. He's working on your behalf. And then number three, he's working for the good. For the good. And this one, it may be, it might be, it could possibly be situational. It could be that the situation you find yourself in right now, the hardship that you find yourself in, could be health-related, could be financial, could be relational, a relationship struggle that you find yourself in. It could be that it works out good. And God works it out, and it ends up being all good in the end. It could be situational. But here's what I know for sure. It is definitely eternal. This passage is, is, is there's, there's a heavy emphasis in this whole chapter of the Bible on an eternal reality. And so your situation might work out for the good. I personally hope it does, okay? But here's what I know for sure and that we can hang our hat on at the end of the day is that ultimately, eternally, if we are in relationship with Jesus, it's going to be all good. It's going to work out for our good in the end. And, and here's how I know this for sure in Romans 8.18, just a few verses earlier. It says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. You know, when, when, when we get to heaven one day, the song, the, the, the famous song, uh, Amazing Grace, as it says, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen? Right? The, 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 the challenges and the hard parts of this life will fade away in comparison to the glory that will be uh, revealed in heaven. And so that's what this passage means, for sure. So here's what it doesn't mean. This is kind of the fun part. Um, number one, this is what it does not mean. It does not mean that everything happens for a reason. And, and I know you've heard that, that phrase before, maybe at work or with friends, and someone tries to cheer you up and they come alongside you and they're like, hey man, just remember, everything happens for a reason. You know, and you're like, yeah, thanks. I can keep going, you know. Awesome, high five. Um, now, if you're talking about cause and effect, we know that cause and effect are real, you know. If I punch you in the face, you'll get mad, right? And that's because I punched you in the face, right? There's a cause, there's an effect. But, but that's not what people mean when they say everything happens for a reason, man. Everything happens for a reason. You know what, you know what people mean? This is what people mean. You don't have to be a believer. Believers, unbelievers alike use this phrase all the time. It's very popular in our culture. Everything happens for a reason. What people mean when they say that is that, hey, there's a God or a cosmic power out there that is just kind of making everything happen, and they're just kind of pulling all the strings, and it's all going to work out in the end, bro, so don't worry about it. Everything happens for a reason. But that's just not the truth. Because if that was the truth, then, then why, when, when Jesus' disciples ask him, hey, how should we pray, Jesus? He says, pray this way. He says, pray, uh, God's kingdom come, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If God's will was always done on earth, then Jesus wouldn't tell us to pray and ask God to make it happen, right? Uh, his perfect will is done in heaven, and that's why it's going to be such an amazing place. But here on earth, we have our will. There's the will of others, and, and all those play a part in what's happening. So everything doesn't happen for a reason. And, and number two kind of goes along with this. Number two, but I'm, I'm going to, at the point of belaboring this point, I'm going to say it again. Number two is, what this passage doesn't mean is that God causes everything in my life. Sometimes we can think that, right? We can think, God, why did you cause this in my life? You know, you get in a car accident, you're like, God, why did you cause, why did you make this happen, God? And God's like, you were taking a selfie while driving down the freeway. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. That's how God talks to me. He's like, why did you act so dumb? You know? Um, that was our fault, right? And it even says it in the Bible in Proverbs 19.3. I'm going to read it because you probably don't believe me. 
But it says this, people ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then are angry at the Lord. Isn't that true? How many of us have done that, right? We ruin our own lives and we're like, God, why? Why am I in this situation? You know? God does not cause everything in our life. Number three, what this passage does not mean. It does not mean that everything is always good. We can kind of get mixed up with that. And we can think sometimes that, man, everything is always good. But anybody who's lived a little bit of life knows that's not true, right? It, th- things don't always end up good. Everything isn't good. There are trials and there are challenges and, and struggles. And uh, 1 Peter 4.12 says it very clearly. It says, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Like, don't be surprised when hard times come your way. It's just a part of life. It's part of this earthly experience. And I I had this happen to me. You know, I mean, I think many times we can be going through life and we can be kind of checking all the right boxes. Anybody, any box checkers in the room, right? You're like, if I just, if I just follow the list, follow the prescription, I do this right, like everything's going to turn out right for me. And and I was in one of those situations where uh, my wife and I were trying to do that. This was about 18 months ago or so. And, and we're like, you know what, we are going to be good with our finances, and we're going to pay cash for our next car. We're going to save up. We're going to pay cash for a car. And we, you know, we were not going to do like a $1,000 car or something. We were going to do a little bit more. Um, so we get some lower mileage, a decent vehicle that lasts a couple years so we could save up more cash and, and get a nicer car and kind of continue that process. And so we saved up about seven grand, And, and we're like, okay. And, and we did some research, and we found a car, um, decent miles on it. We did the car fax, right? You do the car fax. I mean, it's my, it might as well be a word from God that you should buy the car, right? <laughs> if the car fax are good. And so we did the car fax. It was great. It was perfect. Prayed about it. Felt good about it. Felt peace about it. And um, had the money. Paid for the car. Get the car. I, I, well, let me say this. I test drove it too. Bought it from a private seller. Test drove it and uh, put it through the ringer a little bit. Sped up. Took some turns. You know, all that kind of stuff. Braked. Made sure it worked before I per- purchased it. And uh, everything passed every test. So I buy it, I drive home, I'm happy, you know, this is awesome. And later that night, it was like a Saturday night, I had to preach the next morning on Sunday, and um, I'm like, okay, we need some milk for the morning for breakfast, so I'm going to drive to the store and get some milk. I drive down the hill, go to the grocery store, come out, I'm, I'm driving back home, and I'm at a stoplight, light turns green, I hit the gas, and it's like, no, no catch, right? No gear is catching, it's just revving up. And, um, you know, the transmission. Oh, yeah, the dreaded transmission. And uh, I, I took it to the dealership right away. The, it was the weekend, so it wasn't until Monday. And Monday they confirmed what I already knew to be true. They're like, you need a brand-new transmission. No big deal. For seven grand, we can set you up and uh, take care of you. And I'm like, I don't even have a relationship with this car. You know what I mean? Like, I just bought it. I'm not going to pour more money into this thing. And so we ended up, it was so hard, we ended up just cutting it loose, you know, and, and, and cutting our losses and, and lost that car. And that was tough, you know, because with that particular one, it was like we were trying to be financially responsible. Come on, God, you know. We're trying to be responsible. We prayed about it. We test drove it. The car facts, for goodness sake, came back good. It was clean. Why? Why, God, did we have to go through this? And, and what Pastor Jeff has taught us over the years, many times he said this, don't ask why, God. Uh, don't ask why me, ask what God. Don't ask why me, but say, God, what do you want me to learn from this? What do you want me, what can I learn from this really hard situation? And it was, it was amazing. I didn't, I didn't feel that I was attached to money or any way or, or anything like that, but I just recognized I had this whole new revelation, like money wasn't a big deal. It was like I cut it loose, I got past it, I had prayed about it, and I had this revelation, it was like money's not a big deal. Like, it's really not a big deal. And, and it was seven grand, and, and for us, that was a lot of money, but um, it, really, it really isn't that big a deal in the grand scheme of things. And so, um, so that was kind of the, the revelation through it. But, but here's the point. Everything in life isn't good. Hard times come, challenges come, struggles come. So that's not what this passage means. And then number four, uh, what this passage doesn't mean is that we just sit back and let God work it out. We don't just sit back and say, well, God's got it under control. I, I remember I had a guy at, at work when I was at Costco, and I was trying to share 
my relationship with Jesus with him and, and, and tell him about Jesus and encourage him to make a decision for Christ. And, and he was like, well, if God wants to save me, he'll just save me, you know? And I was like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You know what I mean? Like, God already did everything, right? He sent his son to die in our place. And, and, and he did everything. And all we have to do is respond, right? He already put everything out there. We just respond to what he already did. But, but how many of us, we maybe responded to the gospel, but we're like, well, from here on out, all things work, God's working on my behalf, so I just sit back and let this thing happen. That's not, that's not, we're in a partnership with God. That's not what this scripture is saying. We're in partnership with him, and we work together. And, and I had an experience uh, recently, uh, just yesterday, actually, I was going for a run, and um, come on, we did, we ran 20 miles this week. I just got to brag on my wife and I. Uh, we ran 20 miles this week, so, uh, so eight miles yesterday, and, and we were on a run yesterday, and we were about halfway through it. And I'm running down the, down the street, and a, a piece of gravel went in my shoe. And I was trying to, like, run and, and like, pick it out of my shoe, you know, so I didn't have to stop. Because, uh, I mean, we're setting, like, record-breaking times on our runs. Um, personal record-breaking times. Um, and I, I didn't want to stop, but then I, you know, put my finger in my shoe, and it just went underneath my heel. So I was like, okay, time out. I got I to gotta stop. So I stop, and I have to sit down and take my shoe off and shake the, the rock out and and untie my shoe, and then retie my shoe, and it's this whole process um, that's slowing us down, but it had to be done. You know, because I could probably run like a mile with, with a, a pebble in my shoe, and it wouldn't, wouldn't really make a difference, um, but if I ran five miles, I'd probably have a blister, you know, and if I ran 20 miles, I might need to go see a doctor, you know, because cause that little pebble over time, it could just continue to run and aggravate uh, my foot. Well, the same thing is true in life. You know, we're going through life and many times we think that, hey, life is just going to, we, we, we planned it, and it's just going to go, and everything's going to work out to plan. But we get, you know, proverbial stones in our shoes. And we have a choice to make in that moment. We can kind of go a mile and, and see what happens and try to, try to just ride it out. But if we go five miles, you know, that, that issue, that thing, that circumstance that we're not dealing with, it, it's going to kind of wear on us, and it's, we're, we're going to notice but you go, you go 20 miles down the road of life, maybe 20 years down the road of life without addressing some of the things um, uh, that we can pick up in life, some of the pains and the heartaches and, and the struggles that we can pick up in life, man, that, that's going to leave a mark. And it's gonna, you're going to look back and realize that that's directed your life for quite a while. And so I want to encourage you that, that, that God wants us to address these things, and we have to be proactive in addressing those things, and God's prescription for, for how we address these circumstances of life and, and how we find freedom in these circumstances of life is actually in relationship. It's in groups. It's in, it's in uh, relationship with other people and going through life with other people, and I know that to be true in my own life, and, and you know, this fall, we're going we're gonna to have more people in groups at High Ridge Church than we've ever had in the history of the church, and I, I know we will. I'm confident we will. Um, and that's not for us to, to beat our chest or to brag. It's because we want to be a free people, right? We want to walk in freedom. We as a, as a staff, we, we want you to be free. We want to be free ourselves. And so for that, to that end, we want to offer as many groups and as many opportunities for people to get free as possible. And so I encourage you to sign up for a group and, and, uh, or, or host a group and be a part and, and enter into relationships and take the time, and maybe it's a little inconvenient, to slow down and to build relationships and, and get healing and freedom in your life. All right, so, so that's what the passage does mean. It, it's what it doesn't mean. But what is God ultimately trying to say in this, in this chapter of the Bible? And, and, and how do we answer these challenges of life, these struggles in life? What do we say when, when hard times come our way and what gets us through those hard times? And in, in, the, in the final verses of the chapter, Paul actually tells us, and he says this, he says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who can bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is risen, who is seated at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress, or persecution, or peril, or famine, or nakedness, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all things we are, we are 
more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come on, give him some praise today, will you, church? Come on, God is good. And he has an everlasting love for us. And nothing can separate us from his love. And that is the whole point of this chapter and where God was trying to get us to. He said, I know you go through challenging times. I know you're going through hardships. I need you to know that I'm with you. And if I'm with you, I'm for you. And nothing can be against you so the believer does not rest his hat in the triumphs and the tribulations of this present world. But the believer rests his assurance in the love of Christ and that he is faithful. And his love is everlasting. Amen, right? That's a good word. But how do we live it out, right? Man, we can get all excited in a service. We can read the word. We can, we can get pumped up. But how do we live this thing out? And I can't speak for everybody, but I can speak for myself. And what I try to do, what I, what I commit to do, what I have a regular habit of doing, and that's that, that every morning I have a time with God. And, and I do three things, and, and I would encourage you to write these down and try them out. But I do three things. I reflect, I repent, and I re-envision. And, and, and first is that I reflect. I reflect on the previous day. I don't try to go back two years, five years, ten years and reflect. I just, I just look back one day. I reflect and I, and I say, God, what happened in my relationships yesterday? What happened in my conversations? What, what words came out of my mouth? Um, what, what words were spoken to me, and how did I respond to that? What actions did I take? I just reflect. I reflect on the previous day. I reflect. I, I, I sit quietly, and I reflect. Next, I repent. If there's something in that previous day that, that was not God-honoring, I repent of it. And to repent simply means to say, God, your way is right, my way was wrong, and I'm going to do things your way. And, and from this day forward, I'm going to do things. That's what it means to repent. I'm just to say, God. Your way's the right way. And so if there's something in my life that as I reflect, I realize was not of God, then I'll, I'll repent of it. And, 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 I'll, and I'll make it right with God. And then the third thing is, and this is what I think a lot of us struggle with, is, is I re-envision. I re-envision what God has called me to do. I re-envision the purpose that he's placed on my life. The gifts and the talents that he's placed on my life. And, and, and I re-envision, I remind myself, because you know, life is tough. And, and a day can be tough, but, I, but if we remind ourselves of all that God has done in our life, we remind ourselves of, of the gifts he's placed inside of us, the, the secrets he has revealed to our heart, and the things that others have spoken over us, then we can continue to move forward towards that, that desired outcome that he's placed over us. And we try to do that and help in that process as a church uh, in our membership class. We try to help you discover your purpose. And, and we do that through a spiritual gift assessment and through through uh, 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 a profile, personality profile, and with those things, it kind of helps you discover maybe some of the unique giftings that you have, but really those things are worked out as you serve. It's really not, it, it doesn't really get tested until you serve, and, and we'll never really know what it's like to be like Christ until we serve, because Jesus said, he said, I didn't come to, to be served, but to serve and to give my life. And it's not until we begin to serve others and, and make that a focus of our life is to, to think about others and serve them with our life that we really know what it's like to be like Christ and, and we really discover the purpose that God has placed us here on this earth for. And so, so as I close, you know, I, I might be up here. I'm, I'm happy. I, I got a smile on my face. And, and um, I was recounting kind of the last 18 months. I've, I've, this is the third time I've preached this message this weekend. And and my wife was in the first two, and laughed her last night when I, when I went through, like, our last 18 months. She was like, well, gosh, when you put it that way, we had a sucky last 18 months. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> gosh, why am I happy right now? And, um, and, you know, you can get that way when you look back on things. And so I don't, I don't want you to think I'm sitting up here and I've never gone through a hard day. And I don't want to compare lists with you because I know many of you have had much harder uh, days and much harder lives than, than myself. But I want you to know that... that I've gone through some challenges, and, and so with that, I share, I share with you my last 18 months. Um, we had a financial challenge, which I already shared with you in the last 18 months with the, the vehicle. Um, and then 
then even more challenging is, is uh, we, my wife had a miscarriage. And, um, and going through all the pain of that, and I know many of you have, have probably gone through that. And, and then subsequent to that, my wife had to have surgery to, to take care of everything uh, in regards to the miscarriage, um, which is scary, you know? I mean, they make you sign paperwork that if you die while you're under, you know, you're not going to sue them. Like, that's a scary thing to do, right? And um, nobody wants to do that. Um, and, then, and then just at the end of last year, uh, we, had the, we experienced the death of a dream. Um, and for us, that, that dream was, was leading a, a vibrant, healthy, growing church in Santa Barbara, California. And it didn't work out, you know. It, it, didn't, it didn't work out that way. And so there's the death of a dream. And, and many of us have experienced the death of a dream. Uh, whether that's a, a business you started that, that didn't work out in the end or, or uh, a relationship, maybe a marriage. You know, everybody goes into marriage believing that it's going to be great, it's going to be beautiful, it's going to be healthy, um, but maybe your marriage ended in divorce, and that's, that's the death of a dream, you know, and, and, and we all go through different things like that in life, but it's how we respond that counts, and, and I firmly believe that how you respond to life circumstances will direct your whole earthly experience, and, and if you are committed to the cycle of pain and pity and, um, and struggle, <laughs> if you're committed to that, then, then that's what you're going to experience on this earth. But if you're committed to, to saying, I, you know what, God loves me, God is for me, and I'm going to get free from this stuff. And I'm not going to let this bog me down or keep me from, from being the person that God has created me to be. And like I said earlier, um, that happens through relationships. You see, I, I want to end this as I'm, as, I'm, as I'm going through my message preparation. The ending is part of it. And, and I, always, I just want to pray for people and, and expect God to do something great. And as I was praying about ending this service, uh, I was like, God, I just want to pray for people that they'd get healed and, and they'd get free from any, you know, past hurts and pains and stuff like that. And I just felt like God was saying, if I did that, that would just be a Band-Aid. That would just be a Band-Aid. But what God really wants... Uh, all of us to do is to follow his prescription for healing and freedom, and that's being in relationships with others and being, being in a group, being in a small group. And uh, I know that to be true with myself. I know that over these last 18 months, I couldn't have made it without the relationships that are in my life. Obviously not without God, but with the relationships that, that are in my life. The guys that I, that I work out with, uh, there's a whole group of us, pastors and, and some folks that go here that we work out together. And you think, man, a workout group, really? Well, we joke around with each other and we make fun of each other and have fun. But, but we also, there's those side conversations and, and that are built on relationships where, where you ask each other, how are you doing? You know, what's going on in your life? How, how, are, you, how are you navigating through? I know this had to be hard. How are you navigating through that? And, and through that, God can bring healing. And that's God's desire for every single person in this room. And so what I'm going to pray for you today, and we're going to close here in a moment. What I'm going to pray for you is that uh, before you leave this place today, that every single one of us would, would sign up to be in a group and, uh, and, and would sign up to be a part and commit to relationships. So if you want to bow your heads and close your eyes, I want to pray for everybody. And um, I also want to give everybody an opportunity to put their faith in Jesus Christ. As I said earlier, God gave his only son to die in our place. God has done everything in his power to ensure that you spend eternity with him. So now the ball is in your court, so to speak. Now, now, now it's your turn to make a decision. Are you going to receive that free gift of everlasting life and receive all the benefits that come with that? I'll give you an opportunity to do that in a minute. If everybody wants to bow your head and close your eyes, I just want to pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person in this room. I thank you for their life, their heart and desire to serve you. And God, I ask that, that we would be a free, a free people. God, we would walk in freedom, the, the, the things that are dogging us, that are slowing us down from being all that you created us to be, that we would get free from those things. And God, I ask that every single person in this room would sign up to host or be a part of a group. Lord, I ask that you would remind them of the priority of this in their life, that you would help them work out their schedule, clear out their schedule, so that they can make relationships a priority in their life. And I thank you for all that you're going to do through it. In Jesus' name.